This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. scripture where David was anointed but was not crowned and that's a difficult position to be in he was anointed king of Israel but he waited 17 years to be crowned and in that time he was running from King Saul who was the backslidden king of Israel and hated David through jealousy and was out to take his life and Jonathan David's friend and Saul's son slipped out away from his dad and away from the army of Israel, found David at midnight, probably hiding in a cave, and the Bible said he strengthened his hand in God. Mm -hmm. And we all need that, Jerry. We need the oil and the wine. We all need to strengthen one another and encourage one another, and that's what we're here to do. Turning to the Word of God to uh, Matthew chapter 16, verses uh, 13 through 18, and then we'll skip and read verse 20. I'd like to talk to you about foundational truths or the foundational truth. Matthew 16, 13 through 18. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Then in verse 20, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ, or Jesus the Messiah. Notice he did not charge them not to tell people he was God. They would never have thought of such a thing. They were Jews, and they knew that God was the eternal one. And just a glimpse of God's back parts caused their patriarch Moses' face to shine so brightly they couldn't look at it. Mm -hmm. So Jesus said, tell no man that I'm Jesus the Christ. Again about foundations in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. According to the grace of God, Paul says, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another build it thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. For it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet as by fire. Again, Paul, concerning the foundation in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, he says, Ye are the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God 
through the Spirit. I'd like you to notice two things about those verses. That Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but He's in the building with us. He is a part of the building. And Paul said we're built as an habitation of God. Jesus the chief cornerstone of the building. 2 Timothy 2 verses 17 through 19 Paul talked about false teachers and their word will eat as it doth the canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus who concerning the truth have erred saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure having this seal the Lord knoweth them that are his. So we're built on a solid foundation. And whatever a structure anybody else might have added to it, as Paul said, some hay, hay wood, stubble. Whatever it is, the foundation is sure. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Then Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they be rich in good works, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So he seems to indicate that they and we are building a foundation of our lives, of our, of our biblical understanding, of our ministry. Everything seems to be built on a certain foundation. The Bible says much more about foundation. And the Bible says that every house is built by some man. I was uh, interested sometime back I heard a minister preaching on a, uh, the denomination that he belonged to and it's built on 16 main pillars of doctrine. I had my secretary to go online and pull that off and the first, the first pillar is the inerrancy of the scripture, the inspiration of the scripture by the spirit of God. And pillar number two is the doctrine of the Trinity. Seemed like to me those were mutually exclusive. I didn't, I didn't see the relationship there and they took a lot of uh, pains to try to explain it and I read that to Labriska and Jerry yesterday and we felt like all they needed to do was add plus tax. <laughs> it was pretty much of a muddle as Brother Anthony said. Anyway, to God be the glory, I love all of my brethren. And, uh, but I think there's some things that we do need to deal with and uh, we'll deal with it in a scriptural sense. I woke the other morning and it seemed like I was so impressed about the plumb line. I, just, I knew it was a spiritual thing before I got out of bed. When I woke up, I had this on my mind about the plumb line. And so Labriska and I get up early and we drink coffee and read scripture to one another and so I got the Bible. Looked in Amos where Amos says, the Lord God, and he called God the Lord God 22 times in his little book. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line. The wall was made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. The Lord said to me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of Israel, my people. Then in Isaiah, the plumb line is referred to again as a plummet. Isaiah 28, 16, 17. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. Then I found another reference to the plummet in Zechariah. I looked in the Strong's Concordance and it told me that the word plummet means a weight with a line attached. And so I went on and just said, well, the Lord will help me understand more about what this, how it applies to me. In a little while I needed to go to town. This was on Saturday, several Saturdays ago. I went to uh, Springfield, a little town, to get some printing. And when I came back at the BP station, where they have a large parking lot, they had some uh, tables set up and, and more or less yard sale or flea market. So I stopped. 
And the first place I walked up, the man was a retired carpenter. He had a few carpenter tools and he had some miscellaneous items there in a box. And the next thing you know, I looked over in the box and I said, what is this? And he said, it's a plumb box. And I said, wow. I mean, it's only been about three hours since I woke up with the plumb line on my heart. And, uh, and so here is this plumb box. Antique. An antique. And he said, this is worth about $20. He said, it's an antique, solid brass. Lo and behold, I believe I left it at the room, LaBrisca. I cannot believe it. But it's a, if, it, if there's ever been a pretty plumb bob, this is a pretty plumb bob. And, uh, and it has uh, a solid brass. I bought it for $2. He said it was worth $20. You want me to go get it? Well, you can. Jerry, go get it. It's in the room. But anyway, I, uh, I took this home and I polished it up. And I said, well, Lord, I believe you wanted me to have this little plumb bob. And I put me a new string on it. and I, So I just put it aside. There in my office where I could kind of see it every once in a while. But anyway, the Lord has, uh, since that time, began to deal with me regarding the building, the church, and the importance of the plumb line. And I see the Word of God as a plumb line. It goes in a, it goes in a straight line. You know, I think some people's concept of Scripture is that it waffles, that it's ambiguous. But the way I see the scripture, it goes in a straight line. You see, I, I know that more now than I ever did before. I preached for 50 years before I really understood what the Bible was saying to me about the one most high God. You know, I, there were scriptures that just didn't fit. As a, as a church leader told me this past week, and he's dealing with this with his church. He's an elder in a church in in Nashville, but he said what I was reading in my Bible was not what I was hearing over the pulpit. And so he's addressed it with the ministerial board, and he said as a group they were kind of, uh, seemed like they wanted to be offended a little bit, but one-on-one -on -one, they said to him, keep asking these questions. Because I think a lot of people have a lot of questions, and God is putting questions in people's minds and I think it's important that you and I have answers. That you and I have clear answers that go in a straight line as to who God is, as to who the Messiah is, the only way to the Father. Amen? Amen. You see, Jesus said to Peter, Thou art Peter. Now you're a rock, but on this rock, and this is what I believe, this rock of your confession as to who I am, on that confession, on that truth, on that foundational truth, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I know the Catholic Church says the, 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 the church is built on Peter. And I, in a sense, we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. But basically, it's the beliefs that they have. The, the beliefs from God that they held. That's what we're built on, that foundation. And so uh, then God said in the 28th chapter of Isaiah, He had prophesied, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a tried stone, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. And he that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plumb. So I've done a good bit of build in, uh, in the past. we built homes, we built churches, we've done a lot of remodeling, and, and I'm talking about actually with my hands. And, um, and I've used uh, transit to make sure that you get things level, and, and I've used levels, and I've used squares, and plumb bobs, and, and, uh, and to go along with that, I have a, I, I like to think I have a pretty straight eye. And if a picture's hanging sideways on the wall, I can kind of detect it. I'm, I'm not a fanatic about that, but I will go through the house and straighten the picture. Seems like they have a way of moving, you know, and so you, you just go through and straighten them because it just looks better to me if it's lined up, if it's straight. 
And, uh, and it's just important that, uh, that this, like this building, what kind of building would this be if somebody hadn't used a level, a plumb bob, a transit, or whatever else, laser uh, levels that they're using today. Labriska and I have a house in Nashville that we tried to sell for a year and couldn't sell it. It's a nice two-story house. There's only one problem. It was built in the late 40s, and whoever built it didn't put a good foundation on it. They built more house than they had foundation. <laughs> and besides that, water is built in the side of a hill, and water ran off the hill and under the foundation and undermined the foundation. Now, the first thing you want to do if you're thinking about buying a house is look at the foundation. I have a friend that bought a house on a, a lake in Nashville, a beautiful home, and, and he thought he'd check the foundation. He, he just gave it sort of a, a, a preliminary uh, look. He didn't get an expert. And so he paid $275,000 for this house. But as it turned out, the foundation was bad. And someone had built a block wall down in the basement to cover a real bad flaw in the foundation. And he wound up selling that $275,000 house for the price of the lot, which was $100,000. He took a $175,000 loss on that house, which was a tremendous loss. Labriska and I bought this house knowing that it had a bad foundation. But anyway, the, uh, this builder friend of mine, thank you, Jerry, this builder friend of mine uh, said we could fix it, and we did. We fixed it so it didn't get any work, but the damage was already done, and it cracked the brick wall on the outside, the floors unlevel on the inside. We sturdied them up, but it's still unlevel, and, and the windows are a little bit sideways. The doors had to be cut to fit the opening because the opening was a little bit sideways. We bought the, brought the price down tremendously, and we still couldn't sell it for a year. The realtor finally gave up. And so what we did, we got on the outside and took aluminum siding and covered up the damage and, uh, and just rented it out. And so that's about the best thing we could do. Nobody wanted to buy it because the foundation was bad. So it's very important that we build, be built on solid understanding, scriptural understanding. And I think a lot of the, the religious structure that we see today is not built, and I think we all understand that, probably preaching to the choir this morning, but where I think we're built on a foundation uh, of, of our making that is not a solid foundation. And I think that is, this is one thing that God is dealing with in 2009 to repair and replace the bad foundation. Let me just show you a little illustration here. Several years ago, Labriska and our family went to a, an amusement park, park in Arkansas. And uh, as one of the attractions, they had built this real fine house, but they built this on the side of a hill, and purposely they built it sideways to throw you off. And uh, they didn't build it square with the work. I had an old carpenter friend I used to work with, and he'd back off and look at it. He said, now, Joel, I believe that's square with the work. <laughs> right? I mean, we, we, you might just take this for granted, but houses need to be perpendicular, right? <laughs> and so, uh, so this one wasn't, it wasn't built that way. And it threw you off so much that they, they even when you walked out on the porch, they had water and it looked like it was running uphill, but it was actually running downhill. So, I mean, it threw your perspective off completely. I mean, it, it actually fooled your mind to go into this house and, and, and straight look crooked and crooked look straight. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you or not, but I'm dealing with people that they are in a religious structure to the point that when you give them truth, biblical truth, it sounds like heresy to them. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, God is dealing with these things. He said to Amos, Amos, I'm going to put a plumb line in the midst of my people. You know, a, a plumb line, if you just let it do its thing, won't lie. 
Here's my little plumb line right there. Isn't that pretty? My little plumb bob. And it goes. Already I've already got a five dollar offer. If, if you leave this alone, it will point straight down. The word plumb means vertical, straight down. P O U M B. It means plumb, just like God said to, to Amos. You notice that Amos said God was standing on this wall that was built with a plumb line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonder how he could tell that it was built with a plumb line. It was straight. Mm -hmm. This is straight. I mean, there's a straight wall. God was standing on a straight wall built by a plumb line, but also God was holding a plumb line. Mm -hmm. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And he said, I see a plumb line. A plumb line is this line that's on the end, you know, that this weight is tied to. And that's what Amos saw. Now, in 325 A.D., the Nicene Council did that number. Yeah. <laughs> and they said Jesus is co-equal, co-eternal with the Father. Of the same substance with the Father, very God of very God. In uh, 381, the Council of Constantinople came along and added, don't let anybody take, when you're talking to them, take it back to 325 with the Trinity. You know this. Mm -hmm. Because the, the Nicene Council didn't declare belief in the Trinity. They men mentioned the Holy Spirit. But it was 56 years later when the Council of Constantinople did this number. <laughs> And they added the Holy Spirit as the third person of God. Now Jesus told Peter, your confession that I am the Christ, I am the Messiah, on this confession, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen? Now, you know, however God wants to fix it, it's God's church. Paul said the foundation of God stand sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. So I'm not here to indict the church today. I love the church. I weep over the church. I pray for the church as you do. But I am here to give a, a fair assessment of what we built according to what I see in Scripture. Do you believe we have some problems? Yes. In Christianity. Absolutely. I notice when I watch, my background's Pentecostal, okay? I'm not trying to make Pentecostals out of people. Just trying to get people saved. And we, we dropped that label a long time ago because every label has a lot of baggage that goes along with it. Amen? I'm happy to be called Christian. Born again, saved, child of God. Minister of Jesus Christ. Minister of the gospel of God. But I don't like too many labels. But anyway, I notice when I turn on Christian television, that a lot of my Pentecostal brethren have gone into sowing seed, send me your money. And they've made seed, the seed, money. And Jesus said, the seed is the Word of God. Amen. 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 I mean, that's a serious corruption of the word seed. And so, I don't know if you watch much Christian television, but you can go from channel to channel, and normally you don't I have to watch long until they start talking about the seed being money. Sow your seed and the prosperity and all that. You want to have a new... Is there a plumb line through the Scripture? Does the Scripture go in a straight line? Or is the Bible ambiguous about its doctrines? We're going to have to settle that in our mind. You know, we'll have to know who our God is. Because in the 11th chapter of Daniel, it's talking about the last days, and it said, Then they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Yep. And the word exploits means heroic and notable deeds. Mm -hmm. Folks, I don't believe the church is going out powerless. That's right. I don't believe the church is going out anemic. I don't believe it's going out in a whimper. I believe it's going out in a blaze of glory. But there's some things, that's, this is what I came to say. I want to encourage you. 
Jesus said to his disciples, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they're white to heart. And I'm asking you today, and I know you do, but I'm saying to you and to Joel Hemphill, let's lift up our eyes and get our vision as big as our God is. As Brother Anthony and I were talking this morning, you know, the Bible presents sometimes in different situations, different, different problems, and it says, but God. We don't need to forget to factor in God. Right? right. Say, so, well, the whole world has this misunderstanding, but God. I love it. Right? Yeah. Amen. The whole world has built on a, a, a foundation of a, a cracked foundation. We've got a serious problem here. A lot of them are lost in the Trinitarian fun house somewhere. They don't know straight up from sideways. I used to help my dad build. He'd put me to doing something. He'd back off and look at me and say, Son, I believe you've got that little catty wampus. <laughs> That's an English word that was handed down by our English forefathers. Y'all use that word? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, hey. We've, we've got a few things cattywampus, right? And, uh, and God has given us answers. I trust the Scripture to give us those answers. Amen. Right? And, it, and you can set up a point of reference here and a point of reference there, and you can eyesight, and you can put a straight line right across this globe if your laser's strong enough. Amen? Amen. Amen? And so that's the way I see this holy Bible. It's a level, it's a square, it's a plumb line. It's all we need to understand what God wants us to understand. Because I don't believe God's going to empower ignorance. I think em ignorance empowers ignorance. That's the way we said in Tennessee, ignorance. <laughs> but I believe ignorance empowered is dangerous. Yes. The disciples with improper and incomplete understanding were getting dangerous. They said, Jesus, they didn't receive us over in Samaria. Yeah. Do you want us just to call down fire from heaven yeah. and burn them up? <laughs> yeah. They had been empowered, but they were ignorant. You see, God's too wise to do that. My dad didn't give me a pocket knife until I was old enough to know that a pocket knife will cut you. Right? God is not going to give us the power. I hope you're longing for the power that, that the apostles had. I believe we need it. If they needed it, we certainly need it. It's okay. okay. Soak in a little bit. You see, Jesus has promised us more than an anemic church. He said to the apostles and to us in Acts 1, 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. And Labrisca and I, 1965, 66, began to fast and pray for sign, wonder, miracle. As I say, if the apostles needed it in the day that they lived in, how much more do we need it today? The real power of God. I'm not talking about anything to go out and raise money with. Anything to go out and make you a following with. Because, as I said to Brother Anthony this morning, I'm not trying to gather up a following. A following would complicate my life. <laughs> yeah. I, hey, I love a simple kind of life. I have chickens, a donkey, Horses, uh, Labrisca and I go out to the bridge and throw bread to the fish. You know, like a quiet, simple kind of life. So I'm not trying to drum up a follow. Don't pastor a church. If God said to, I'd be glad to. But that's not what I'm about. But let me tell you, I'm eating up with people to know who the one most high God is. Amen. Because without knowing who he is, how are we going to love him? Jesus said the greatest commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Folks, since I found this, 
I have fallen, as the old saying goes, head over heels with God the Father. I absolutely love my Father, and I'm asking Him to help me love Him more. But we've lost the fear of God. What has happened in our society? People have lost the fear of God. In the pulpit, a lot of ministers have lost the fear of God. Again, Christian television. And they, they act like they've got God on a string, that they just pull it and God will do this or God will do that. You don't manipulate the one I'm talking about this morning. He's our awesome God. But we need the fear of God. I'm not talking about a cowering fear. I'm talking about a reverential fear. Our Lord Jesus walked in the fear of the Lord. And Isaiah said it made him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Then I, in, uh, in Hebrews uh, uh, 5 and 7, it said Jesus prayed with strong crying and tears to the Father, and he was heard in that he feared. So our Lord Jesus had a reverential fear of the Father. So people are not going to get their lives straight. I'm going to say this in all reverence. As long as they think God is a six-foot man, the lowly Nazarene. No, our God is a consuming fire. When He speaks, lightning runs up and down the mountains and trumpets blast and people run screaming, don't let Him speak again lest we die. But that God loves us this morning. <laughs> and that gets me excited. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, God's blessed me through the years to know some scripture. But a lot of these scripture I applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. My precious old dad did because he was Jesus only. That was the best of his understanding. I know he saved the day the Lord spoke to me and told me I was going to write these books. He told me, your father rests in my bosom. So I don't have to worry about that. He had an incomplete understanding. A hard thing for me was to say to my heavenly father, Father, my earthly father was mistaken. But I had to come to terms with that. And so, but I, these scriptures that I've known through the years and learned from a child, I have to, I have to now filter them through this understanding. So the other morning I was up dressing for the day. And the scripture came to me, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And in my mind, I could hear my old dad giving that to the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, I'm going to go check that. And it said in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, he said, submit yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. Folks, I came with good news today. Your heavenly Father cares about you. Amen. He's aware of you today. He reads the very thoughts and intents of your heart and mind. His heart is tender towards you. Hey, that's revolutionary. That the God, the creator of the universe, loves us. And he's bigger than all of our problems, bigger than all of our needs, bigger than all of our questions, bigger than all of our lack of understanding. But he wants us to have power. Uh, you know, hey, we're raised Pentecostal, okay? We expect power. We might not have any more than anybody else, but we expect it. <laughs> Start. We're looking for it. <laughs> Let me tell you something. We've got a hold of the little end mm -hmm. of the greatest truth yes. the world has ever known. Yes. Yes. That's, 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 that, you know, absolutely. It absolutely staggers my mind. Mm -hmm. This is an mm -hmm. investment. And yes, we're investing. Mm -hmm. We're investing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm willing to do it. Willing to put everything on the line. Somebody said that. But I just hope that you'll just have a little more, you know, uh, 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 courage in sharing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I see God on my face. God, mm -hmm. give me wisdom. Give me terminology. Give me phraseology. Mm -hmm. Paul said we persuade men. Mm -hmm. Paul was an awesome persuader. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. 
And if it was just one-on-one, -on -one, going down by the river bank where he found some devout women praying. Amen. He didn't have to have a big crowd. He just go down there and share one on one. And one Lydia, the first convert in all of Europe, Lydia. And then Lydia invited them to stay at her house. They did. And when they'd get up and go to church, they'd pass by where this girl was set up telling fortune. And she would cry out with that demon, these men are servants of the Most High God. And one day Paul got enough of it and he turned around and said in the name of Jesus Christ come out of her and that evil spirit came out and it sparked great revival in Philippi. Wound up in jail but they birthed a church in a jail. Right? So anyway, God can take the smallest thing and ignite it. And I'm living in expectancy. And, and this thing's going to ignite it. It is. I know it is. And I just want you to have it. And I know you do. I'm preaching to the choir, okay? But I just want you to sense just a little of our excitement. Hey, all people have to do is listen a little bit. And this will stick to them like the tar baby. <laughs> <laughs> to God be the Lord. Thank you. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio. Preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Shahid from Patna, India, has sent us a question that's a bit of a touchy subject for some people, so I'm glad someone's actually asked it, and we have a chance to answer it on air as well. Shahid writes, The Bible says women are to submit to their husbands. How do I get my wife to do this and respect me like the Bible says is her duty? Hello, Shahid. Well, this question is not as culturally biased as some might assume. There are plenty of spouses in Western countries who struggle with the same thing, because after all, Scripture says the man is the head of the wife, right? <laughs> yeah, is that a trick question? My wife would say that if I'm the head, then she's the neck that turns the head. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly the submissive type, then, eh? <laughs> not really, no. Well, let's take a look at this. Again, it's a fair question, because yes, Scripture does say the husband is the head of the wife. But, men, if you're asking, how do I get my wife to submit to me, you're asking the wrong question. The question you should be asking is, how do I become the husband my wife needs in order to joyfully, willingly submit to me? Mm, which is a good point. Our first work is to be the very best man of Yah we can be. Yeah. Well, let's have a look at Ephesians chapter 5. This is where we get the admonition for wives to obey their husbands. So could you read verses 22 and 23, please? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto Yahuwah. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Now, guys, don't look at that verse and focus on the first phrase. Yes, it says that the husband is the head of the wife. Yes, you are the head of your home and you are to lead it. But this doesn't make you the, the, the big shot, the told you so boss of the world. Mm. The next phrase tells us how we are to head up our homes. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the saviour of the body. Now read verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Any discussion of wives submitting to their husbands has got to be in this context. Paul says husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, in the same way Christ loved the church. And how did he love his church? Well, he gave the ultimate sacrifice, his life. So, the question then becomes, what am I willing to sacrifice for my family? It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have to literally die for your wife, but it does mean you're going to put her first in your life after Yah. Analyse your priorities. What are they? Are you focused on getting your own needs met? Or are you careful to make sure your wife's needs are met? That is how Yahushua loved the church. 
It's a weighty responsibility to be the head of the family in a very real way. We represent Yah to the family, and Scripture presents Yahweh as a loving father. If we're overbearing, insisting that it's my way or the highway, we're going to damage our children's views of Yah as a loving heavenly father. We represent Yah to them, and, and that's serious. Yes, yeah, you're right, Mars. it really is. Our children form their mental image of Yah. They form their earliest emotional attachments to him based on how they view us. So how are we representing Yah to our wife and children? If we're not reflecting Yah's image, what are we reflecting? That's a really good question. And I'm, I'm, I'm feeling convicted even just sitting here that I, I, I need to visit this issue and make sure that my will is always surrendered to Yah so that he can live through me. It's, it's a really solemn responsibility, isn't it? We can't expect our wife to respect us if we're presenting the false image of Yah. Obviously, we're not Yah, but people expect to see what he is like through us. We're to be a channel through which divine love can flow to each family member. Yes, we're to love our wives just as Yahushua loves his church. That means that we are to selflessly help her to become the best wife she can be. And how? By creating an atmosphere in the home that invites the presence of Yah. As head of the home, we're to invite the presence of Yah into our homes and dedicate ourselves, our families and our homes to him. As the husband and father, as the head of the family, we set the standards and values for the home in a very real way. We determine what's important, and I'm not saying that in a dictatorial, imperial way. What I mean is we have more influence over our children than we realise. We can't leave it to our wives to struggle on alone, holding the standards high while we neglect the family so that, let's say, we can play a computer game. What kind of language do you use? What movies do you watch? These have an impact on your children, and if your wife is trying to teach the children a high biblical standard and your example negates what she's trying to teach, guess which one of you is going to have the greater influence on the kids? Uh, well, I will, which is a scary thought. We're to be men of Yah. We are to walk with Yah as Enoch did, continually surrendering to his will. We can't expect our wives to submit to us unless we have already submitted to Christ. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that we will get either dictatorial, demanding in a way Yahushua never did, or we'll get careless and take her for granted, which also dishonours her in a way Yahushua never did. There's a verse here I'd like to read that I think puts this whole head husband versus submissive little woman into perspective. It's from uh, Matthew 20, uh, verses 25 to 28. Yahushua is explaining just what it means to be the head. Okay, and he says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. If we're being the head of the home we should be, if we're representing Yahweh as he intends, we're not going to be demanding obedience. We're going to be serving the needs of the family in the same loving way Christ served the needs of the church, and that is true headship. Mm -hmm. Now, one final thought from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28. Therefore, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. We're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. This will mean we will never arbitrarily exert our will over hers just because we wear the trousers in the family. That's wrong. As the head of the home, we're to lead our family to Yah. And if you do this, you will be richly blessed. Keep sending us your questions at worldslastchance.com. We always enjoy hearing from our listeners. This is Jane Lamb with your daily promise from Yah's Word. Jay Martin was a devout Christian woman living in Houston, Texas in the United States. She was also a loving, protective mother of a young child. 
One day, a store opened in her community near the elementary school. The thing that concerned Jay and other members of the community was that the store sold merchandise connected to the occult. To make matters worse, Jay and others in the community were fairly certain that the store also operated as a front for selling illegal drugs. At this time, Jay was a member of a mummies group that would gather together to pray for the protection and well-being of their children. Such a store opening in their community concerned the women, and the possibility of drugs being sold increased the potential for violent crime in their neighbourhood. It wasn't long before some of the schoolchildren noticed the shop and began to wander over after school. They seemed fascinated by the different products for sale, things they had never been exposed to before. The mothers decided to do something about it. Jay went and spoke to the owner of the store. She told him various members of the community were concerned because their children were being exposed to the occult via his shop. She asked if he would consider relocating his store to another area more suitable to the sale of his products. The owner flatly refused. He said there was nothing wrong with his merchandise, and furthermore, he wasn't breaking any laws. He was not moving. Jay was undeterred. Next, she called the company that leased the retail space and spoke to the agent. She explained the concerns and asked if he would reconsider the lease due to the store being in such close proximity to the elementary school. Like the man who owned the store, the leasing agent saw no reason why the store owner shouldn't rent the space. Jay was frustrated by the spiritual warfare she saw being waged. Well then. She decided, "We'll just have to pray them out." At the next prayer meeting, Jay told the other mothers about her fruitless attempts to have the store relocated outside their community. The women had been praying for the spiritual safety of their children all along, but now Jay suggested adding one more request to their prayer list. Why couldn't they pray and ask the father to arrange circumstances to move the store out of their neighbourhood? The other women were startled. They'd never thought of using prayer as a direct weapon before, but they agreed, and began praying that Yahya would do what they couldn't, move the store and its influence away from their children and out of the neighbourhood. They had tried everything they could without success. It was time now for heaven to work. The women prayed fervently, claiming the promises. Within two months. The store was gone. Sometimes life presents situations for which we have no answers. There are problems for which we have no solutions, but Yah does. In Romans eight, Paul asks, "What shall we then say to these things? If Yah is for us, who can be against us? If you have a problem and you don't know how to solve it." Pray about it, claim a promise, and ask your friends to pray about it too. In Matthew eighteen verses nineteen and twenty, the Savior declared, "I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them." We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. What would you say if I tried to tell you that your salvation was not based on the death of the Savior, it was not based on the love of the Father, and that your faith or lack thereof had nothing whatsoever to do with your salvation? How would you react if I told you that your salvation was determined by some cosmic game of chance, a divine luck of the draw? Well. <laughs> If you didn't laugh me out of the room, I hope you would say you're crazy. And yet, shocking as it may seem, 
Many sincere Christians believe this very thing. To learn more, check out our website, worldslastchance.com. Watch the video, Predestination Lottery for Your Soul. Once again, that's Predestination Lottery for Your Soul on worldslastchance.com or look for WLC videos on YouTube. Hey boys and girls There is no outer space We're on a flat world They fooled the human race We all fell for it before No one should buy it to the sky The sun goes around you Then look up at night The moon is doing that too All the Star Wars movies are lies Cause space can only be in your mind Space is a farce There's a dome over us NASA is a lion Freemason gang Space is a farce the earth was created for us There was no home There was no home Big Bang Hey mom and dads Time to wake you up We all fell for it before And no one should buy it anymore Space is a farce There's a dome over us NASA is a lion Freemason gang Space is a farce The earth was created for us There was no Big Bang Space is a farce there's a dome over us Astronauts were never drinking the Space is a farce The Earth was created for us There was no
Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In His great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events, and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, for Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues and the earlier trumpets will wreak havoc on the earth and cause unprecedented destruction and misery. Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again." Unquote. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, he declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining his kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open eager to receive all who come to Him.